بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It uh, is a great honor and a great privilege, as always, uh, to spend Tuesday evenings in such a noble pursuit. Um, you know, someone once asked Imam Malik, radiallahu an, what was the most beneficial thing that one could study? And of course, the Imam could have given many responses, uh, but he did not say uh, and he did not say a hadith of the Prophet He said to study that knowledge, and of course these could include fiqh and could include a hadith of the Prophet He said, but to study that knowledge that will take you from one end of the day to the next or to the other end of the day, this is the most beneficial thing that one can study. Right. So, of course, that involves our, you know, fardain, our individual religious obligations. But even more than that, that involves the knowledge of the heart, knowing how to rid ourselves of arrogance and conceit and rancor and negative thoughts and having a bad opinion of Allah, etc. And uh, as opposed to me teaching this book for a second time, mashallah. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, the time we spent together teaching this book. Um, the first time that we reviewed it, we thought it would be more interesting and more engaging and people would enjoy it more if we had a conversation. And so this week, I have the distinct honor of conversing with my brother and also a fellow graduate of Al-Azhar University, uh, Imam Rizwan Ali, who is uh, serving as Imam at the Islamic Center of Naperville and also a teacher at uh, CPSA. Uh, someone that, mashallah, we've been in the same orbits for a very long time, but it's good to finally sit down and converse. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, I'm well, I'm well. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How, how are the uh, brothers and sisters in uh, Naperville? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We see that you brought one of your... Mashallah. Jules, mashallah, Mustafa Ghafoor from, from Naperville, mashallah. So this is like uh, the takeover of the Napervillians, mashallah. They're coming to Tetlif and they're taking over. Um, the chapter for today uh, is about rancor. So just initial impressions. When you hear the term rancor, this can be from the text or can just be um, from you. What do you. What do you think about when you hear rancor? Rancor is something that it's very destructive, but it's very common. And it's something very difficult to deal with because I think at some level, all of us go through it at, and it's very hard to identify and hard to acknowledge, but very important to do so. Mm. And it's one of those things that it'll affect a person's, if left unsettled or untreated or unrecognized, it will affect a person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will affect a person's relationship with other, with their own selves and with other people as well. Mm -hmm. right. When I say that it will affect the person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's thinking about, you know, why does this person have that and I don't? Negative thoughts and assumptions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could lead to envy. It could lead to jealousy. It could lead to just not being happy for other people. Mm -hmm. It can lead to when a person has that negative expectation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that leads that person to focus not on what Allah has blessed them with and what they have, rather than they focus on what's missing in their life, quote unquote missing. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a sense of ingratitude. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we know through the story of Yusuf alayhi salam and his brothers, it leads people to do foolish and irrational things. Mm -hmm. And shaitan finds his way in to justify these things to the people that a person in their own right frame of mind would not do. It sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that 
in your remarks, you are using rancor as a synonym for envy. Yes. All right. So sometimes you see, sometimes people will make that distinction. Sometimes people will use them as synonymous. But I think the concept of, you know, uh, in Arabic, we say, tamanni zawal al-ni'ma. Is hasad is that when you want a blessing from somebody to be taken away, and rancor also is that you're just not happy for other people. Mm -hmm. You're not happy. So both of them are very closely related, and they have to do with diseases of the heart. So I'm just going to try to combine them and try to address them both together, yeah. because even if you don't want that person not to be happy, just not being happy in other person's success or not being able to rid the heart of negative feelings towards others. All of these are very detrimental to our spirituality. And this is something that it needs to be addressed. I mean, I think the, the root of envy is comparison. Um, but a part of me feels like comparison is something that we all engage in. Because without comparison, how do you get any sense of, uh, I guess, um, what you have or what you are or where you rank. So we will compare how someone is treated compared to how I'm treated or uh, how comfortable a person appears materially compared to how comfortable I am or am not materially. We will compare um, how respected or esteemed one might be compared to say how respected or esteemed uh, I am. Um, is there, uh, any hope that we as people will not compare ourselves to other people? Yeah, I don't think the comparison is the issue, right? I think comparison, mm -hmm. as all of the things you're mentioning, are very, very valid. So if I see that a person is, mashallah, doing financially well, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If I see a person is being respected, a person is being treated with dignity, all that's fine. But when rancor and it becomes negative is that when a person resents a person for that, or wants that person to come down. If a person sees somebody and says, mashallah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed that person with wealth. Allah blessed that person with knowledge. Allah blessed that person with a lot of good things. I would like to have that. There's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. right? But when a person wants that person to come down or it becomes uh, resentful to that person or wants that person to go through uh, difficulties or challenges, that's what happens with rancor. And that's when it becomes negative. But if a person says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that person is being treated very well, they have given dignity and respect, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless that person, to increase that person, and to raise my level as well. This is something that is natural and is even encouraged to do at times. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the Arabs, uh, in the, the, the language of the Arab, like Lisan al-Arab, um, a distinction is made between hasad and ghibta, ghibta. Yes. right? Hasad is, you know, wishing that the blessing someone else has would be removed from them, right? So they have a happy marriage, I wish that they didn't. They have material comfort, I wish that they didn't. They are respected by people, I wish that they weren't, right? Ghibta is when you are desirous of something someone else has, but you're desirous of it, not to the extent that, you know, I want them to lose it so that I can gain it. Rather, I would like to have it too. So part of me feels like rancor um, is kind of rooted in this idea of scarcity, this idea that the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not significant enough for this person to have whatever they enjoy and you to have what you want and what you can enjoy. And I'm reminded of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in which he was speaking to Ibn Abbas when he said, the favor of God is such that if all of the human beings and all of the jinn that have ever lived were to request of Allah everything they ever wanted and Allah were to give them that all at the same time, it would not decrease the fadl, the favor that God has in his possession in the least. When you talk about hasad and envy, it's like, you know, what he was saying, it's very true because if a person sees another person having a happy marriage, they just don't want that person to have a happy marriage. Even if they don't, maybe that person might not even be married themselves. They just resentful that that person has a happy marriage. That's why rancor and hasad is so evil is because it's just, 
you want the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon someone to be taken away. And definitely that comes from that scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. right? And alhamdulillah, our sharia and our religion teaches us that the more a person is grateful and appreciative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase them. Mm -hmm. so not only, it's one of our scholars have said, not only for themselves, wow. but also for other people. If you're grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed this person, Right? And we know one of the best things that a person can do to increase their own reward is make dua for a brother in his or her absence. Mm -hmm. And there's an angel that's appointed and says, Amin wa laka Amin, mm -hmm. and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the same. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we have to acknowledge that it will come, right? I, I, this is part of us living in this society. Um, again, you may, you, personally, you may hear me rail a lot on social media because I think some of these things, heart, disease of the heart, are exasperated because of the way that people use social media. I know it's a tool that can be used for positive, but I think that if a person has to know him or herself and realize that if they don't monitor, then it can become very problematic, right? Looking at what people have and, you know, where they went on vacation, their pictures and all these things. If a person has that tendency that they can't make dua for somebody, they can't want good for somebody, and that leads them to thinking about what they don't have, then it may be better just to limit their use of this because it can have a spiritual impact on a person. You know, the word ghil, which is the, the word that he's using for rank is ghil. And of course, ghil comes from ghalayan, which means to boil, or something to boil over. So if, you know, and, and, and Arabic words have an amazingly, um, you know, they, they, they have a, a, the quality of imagery. When you understand like uh, the uh, etymology of words, you know, very vivid pictures come to mind, right? So ghil is like when you see somebody and there's like a, a, this emotive response of like you're boiling inside, you get really hot. This, you know, something about them or something about what they have that really roils you, it's like, that's a ghil, right? And I'm reminded of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we learned in the muwatta of Imam Malik that the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in Masjid al-Nabawi and he said to the companions, you know, the next person that comes through this door is a person of paradise. And the person that came through the door was just an inconspicuous member of the community. It wasn't like saying Abu Bakr or Omar or Uthman, somebody that if he said that and they saw Abdurrahman ibn Awf standing, of course, you know, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, of course, we, you know, we would expect that. But it was just an inconspicuous member of the community, right? And in the riwayah that we learned, it was actually Abdullah ibn Omar that went to this man's home. And he said, you know, me and my dad were having some issues do you think that I could stay with you for a little while just until things cool down? Now, see, a lot of people don't know this, and this would be very hard. In fact, it might be impractical to implement in our society, but that if your brother or your sister is mutasharrid, they are completely dispossessed with nowhere to go, they actually have a right upon you that they could stay with you for three days and three nights, right? But that was a much closer knit community. People knew each other. And I'm, I'm guessing there was less perceived risk in inviting a stranger into your home. Uh, people would often alight with, uh, travelers would alight with residents all the time. That was a regular occurrence, right? Somebody comes to my door, you know, I get three days, subhanAllah. It would be very difficult, right? But at that time, People took those hukuk very seriously, took those rights very seriously. So he said, yes, you, you can stay with me. And Abdullah ibn Omar said he was observing this man. And he saw him going out to pray the salawat, but comes not coming back in. He's praying the five prayers, he's coming back in. He's not sitting and making dhikr. He's not sitting and remembering Allah, right, for extended periods of time. He's not reciting from the Quran. And at the end of the third day, Abdullah says, you know, there's not actually anything going on between me and my father. 
The man said, why did you make up that story? He said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that you were a person of paradise. And I just wanted to know, what do you do so that I could emulate you? And the man sat and said, there's nothing that I do that no one else does. I don't do anything special. He said, oh, but there is this one thing. I don't go to sleep with any ghil. I don't sleep with any rancor in my heart for anyone that has wronged me. I don't have any ghil in my heart. I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a, a vindictive person. And just his ability to free himself of being vindictive, of free himself of vindictiveness, God gave him the bushra. God gave him the glad tiding of paradise. Just being someone that it was easy for him to forgive people. If someone wronged me, it's okay, I forgive you. God elevated him because of that, right? So sometimes I think rancor is something that we think it's between us and that person. I can't stand her, I can't stand him. But it's really between us and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because whatever they have, or whatever they are, or whoever they are, this is what Allah decreed for them. And then in your limited knowledge, you don't even know if this thing will be good for them or bad. This thing, you're so jealous that this person has this or that. You don't know, will that serve them or ultimately destroy them? Will that elevate them? Or will that debase them? Will that bring them near to the divine presence? Or will that remove them? You don't know any of this. So why be envious? Why be rancorous? Right? Going into Imam Maulud's words, he says, rancor. Oh, you who seek its elucidation. Is when the heart is bound to treachery. What do you think about that first, that first bait? Subhanallah, I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, as you were saying that it's about, you know, internally you're having this discomfort or you feel like it's going to boil over. Remember, we're not responsible for, at times we're not responsible for how we feel and what thoughts come to us. It's how we act upon them. Mm -hmm. And that's something which is very, very important. Like even with some of the things we talk about in terms of anger, frustration, things will happen. But it's what you are going to do with that that is really important. Because if I just naturally, there's sometimes people, it's like even it's just something that sometimes we don't talk about enough. But I think it's very important for us to um, you know, highlight at times is that sometimes when we talk about the companions of the Allah and whom we think that all of them were best friends in every situation, circumstance. And that's not reality, right? That's not that's this very romanticized version. There were times where even the companions of the Allah and home, they got into it, they wrote letters back and forth, but they didn't let whatever differences or disagreements they had, you know, escalate to the point of they abusing each other of their rights. So it's very important. Like I know, I remember a few years ago, we were giving a series of lectures like this at the masjid. We were talking about a lot of different things. And one of the most difficult things, and I told the people, they said, you talked about a lot of things, but the most difficult thing is to be able to forgive people. Mm -hmm. and to move on and sometimes it's 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 very difficult because i don't know sometimes yeah it's easy to say forgive the person but i don't know what the person did and it's easy to say but what does it mean to forgive a person from an islamic perspective does that mean that we're going to go back and just be buddy buddy with the person as if nothing happened that's very hard and unrealistic at times but does it that mean that you know what this person as a muslim i'm going to give them him or her their rights and that's something we need to kind of focus on. Yes, inshallah, if you give their rights based on the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we'll talk about some of those things. Can that relationship improve? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Can that expectation of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala improve? Definitely it can. But you have to start. Sometimes when you feel that uh, when rancor starts to set in and then you cut yourself off, 
whether from the individual, whether from yourself, whether from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that situation becomes worse. And we'll talk about mm-hmm. some of the things from the Sunnah of the Prophet. So it's very important for us to understand. And you know, alhamdulillah, one of the things that I've heard about that leaf and I really appreciate about Sheikh Abedullah Evans is these things that we're talking about, we're not just talking about theoretical, that it sounds mm-hmm. good, mm-hmm. and then, but it's unrealistic. We want to make this really practical and actionable because we want to say that, yes, uh, he's talking about forgiveness, but there's just going to take, I just don't even know how I'm going to forget, forgive that person for what they did. Mm. Understood. But let's say, how can we deal with the situations? Because rancor and the inability to forgive a person is not necessarily negatively impacting that person, but it impacts us first. Absolutely. Right. So when you talk about treachery, it's not only treachery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that you're questioning the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're being unfair to yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's something we have to understand is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to be unjust to ourselves. But when we're jealous or envious or have rancor, ill will and malice in our hearts towards somebody, we are focusing our time, our energy, our resources, which are extremely limited in things that are detrimental rather than beneficial. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's weird because I think some people dealing with rancor, in my experience dealing with rancor myself, is that sometimes you, fe- you fear that to forgive is to condone. Like if I forgive you, I'm actually giving you license to do it again. Or I'm saying that it wasn't really that bad. Or I'm saying that um, it's okay. And, 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 and if you want to forgive, you have to get past that, right? You have to recognize that, no, you can actually stand a very firm moral ground and say, no, this was wrong, but I'm forgiving for the sake of Allah. This was wrong. What happened to me was wrong, and I expect some accountability, but I'm forgiving for the sake of Allah because I want Allah to forgive me. Right, the famous, famous story of Mishlah, mm-hmm. right, the, uh, who was, uh, you know, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, was um, not only very wealthy, but very generous. And when people in the early Muslim community would accept Islam, and they would be, you know, uh, excommunicated from their families or tribes or banished or Sayyidina Abu Bakr, would often become their patron. He would often become their mumawil. Uh, he would become their financial support. So it's like, if you become Muslim and nobody deals with you anymore, don't worry about it. You're on my tab, right? Sayyidina Abu Bakr paid for the emancipation of Sayyidina Bilal, right? So this was something that he did. When that vicious rumor, the hadith of ifk, was spread about Sayyidina Aisha, radiallahu anha, who is the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, uh, people really uh, uh, participated. You know, that with, you know, the nature of rumors is that sometimes they can be irresistible. You know, even good people can get pulled in to inadvertently spreading very toxic rumors. Sometimes they do it without even thinking about the fact that they're doing it. They just heard something and now we're just talking about it over dinner. And famous companions like Hassan bin Thabit, he got involved in spreading that. I mean, he was the poet laureate of the Prophet So his tongue is a mighty one. He got involved and uh, Mishtah, right? The, uh, the man who received the support of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he also got involved. Now you would think, just thinking pragmatically, if a man supports me financially, I probably don't want to participate in spreading rumors about his daughter. I mean, that, at least I would think that, you know, if I heard everybody talking about it, I probably would say, hey, I don't know what happened, but I know her father is a very generous man. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to talk about that. But rumors are irresistible sometimes. So he participates. After, say, the Aisha, radiallahu anha, is exonerated, 
And her name is cleared in the Quran in Surah An-Nur. And Allah Ta'ala makes it clear that anybody who launches an accusation of sexual misconduct, particularly in this ayah against believing women, without being able to substantiate their accusation, they should be regarded as liars, they should be punished. And this is a sin called qadf. To say, this is what we, we really, some people don't recognize how serious that is. If you see someone, you know, I think her and the guy at the job have something going on. That's a, that's a crime. It's not only a sin, that's a crime. Yeah, I think him and that girl, they have something, that's a crime in the Sharia. That's a crime. Now, we don't do that. Now, we don't do that, right? The most, I don't know, I mind my business. From the beauty of a person's Islam, leaving things that don't concern you, right? But after, say, the Aisha's name is cleared, the man, uh, Mistah, he has the audacity to come to Sayyidina Abu Bakr and he says, you know, I really apologize for uh, you know, spreading the rumor about your daughter. But do you think you could kind of resume those payments? Because, you, know, <laughs> you know, that's good. You know, that, you know since you, you've stopped giving us, it has been very difficult to make ends meet. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, I swear, I will never give you anything. After what you did to my daughter, you disparaged the honor of my family, I'll never give you anything. They went and told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Now, mind you, they were also spreading rumors about his wife. They said, you know, it's really hard for us to make it. Abu Bakr is not giving us do you think you could talk to him? Do you think you could intervene on our behalf? Look at the graciousness of the Prophet ﷺ. I'll talk to him. The only thing he says to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, don't you want Allah to forgive you? Don't you want Allah to forgive you? Don't you want Allah to forgive you? That's, this is their level of piety. That's all he had to say to him. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? For anything you've done wrong, don't you want Allah to forgive you? Right? Sayyidina Abu Bakr not only reinstates these payments, he increases them. That is why we say, if you place the Iman of Sayyidina Abu Bakr on one side of the scale and you place the Iman of everybody else, his Iman would outweigh the Iman of everyone else. Not only does he reinstate the payment, I'll reinstate the payment and I'll increase the payment, right? Just trying to free himself of rancor, free himself of hink, right? Animosity, right? So we'll stop there, inshallah. Yeah, just right real quick, the additional thing. Um, SubhanAllah, I wasn't really going to talk about when he was talking about this, something came to mind. Very difficult situation. He did something wrong, he messed up. But how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to him in the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ayah, he doesn't refer to Mista as the one who spread rumors, as the one who did this, as the one who did that. He refers to him as a relative, as someone in need, and someone who migrated for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu anha, when she heard that Mista was doing it, she referred to him not as the one who spreading rumors, but she said, didn't he participate in the battle of Badr? So one of the ways that we can, inshallah, help ourselves deal with ghil and rancor and, and, and animosity is focus on the positive characteristics and Allah. attributes of a person. Allah. Everybody has them, right? The Prophet said, a believer doesn't aid another person. If there are certain aspects they don't like, they're sure to find other aspects that they like. So every single person, whether the believer is not, we all have positive qualities and characteristics and we have negative qualities and characteristics. Okay. But if someone highlighted our negative qualities and characteristics, oh. how would our lives be, right? I, I say this in marriage is a lot, right? <laughs> because that can happen very easily. Oh. Right? There's oh. all these idiosyncrasies that people have, but a lot sometimes you can tell that those things that you might find inconvenient, annoying later, later you'll cherish those, right? So try to focus on the positives and overlook some of the negatives, right? Put yourself in a position so you don't get hurt. That's fine. 
But always try to focus on the positives, and this will help, inshallah, with the end of class. And the last thing I'll say just about that um, is one, one, of the, one of the students at the Island program where I was teaching uh, last week, you know, he mentioned that whenever we're, we're guilty of doing something wrong, all of us employ a number of uh, explanatory tools, right? How it happened. And we do that so that we can proceed through life without being demoralized, without saying like, I'm worthless, I'm nothing, I'm wretched, I'm vile. There's always some reason it was the context or it doesn't express the best of who I am. Ibn Ta'illah, Iskandari, right? Um. He mentions that this is one of the mercies. This is one of the strangest lines I've ever read from Ibn Al-Ta'ila. He said, this is one of the mercies in, 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 in God telling us about shaitan. So that when you do something wrong, you don't have to just look at yourself and say, I'm wretched. You can say, oh, I was heedless and I, you know, I, I let my guard down and shaitan deceived me. Shaitan did. Shaitan was able to, to, to take advantage of my lack of vigilance and this was also a part of this action that I did. So that even in that, you don't have to say I'm worthless, I'm nothing. He said, if we could just find one of those reasons that we were willing to offer other people, we wouldn't have rancor, right? When we do something, there's lots of reasons why. It was this, it was that, it was this, I was going through a lot, this, that, I'm really a good person. I, there's lots of reasons that we don't feel like whatever was done is an essential expression of who we are. But when other people do things, we never look at the context. We never look at the situation. We never say it was shaitan. We never, it's just who they are. It's just who they are. Offering people some of the mercy we offer ourselves is a way of, 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 of freeing ourselves of rancor. You know, I find that the beginning of that process for me is just being able to pray for somebody that I feel wronged me. Just being able to pray for them. And, you know, it was, it was weird because somebody once really wronged me. I felt like they really um, did something uh, harmful to me. And I would wake up and I would try to pray for them, but I could not do it. I would put my hands up and I said, no, I cannot do it. And it took me like three months to actually pray that God would have mercy on them and guide them. And it was the strangest uh, kind of experience with rancor. Like I, there was something in my heart that would not allow me to pray for them. Every time I tried to, I said, no, I can't. I, can't. I, just, I, just, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Um, but I kept praying that I could find the strength to do it. Like, you know, just pray for them, right? Because I, I was I asked one of my teachers, I said, you know, I, I have a lot of bold in my heart for this person based on something they actually did. Um, and, and he would say, just make dua for them. Just make dua for them. And through that dua, Allah will remove this, this rancor. Exactly, uh, that's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's very real, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I, whenever we talk about any subject in Fizkiyah, sometimes we feel like it's a linear process that today is going to be good, tomorrow is going to be better, the third day is going to be even better than that. But that's not how life works, mm -hmm. right? You'll mm -hmm. take two steps forward, you'll take two steps back, you'll take one to the right, one to the left, right? But the process is ongoing and continuously working at it. That mm -hmm. if you know, at that time you said that, look, I tried, I give up, I'm not going to do it then that problem would have become worse. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, yes, you know, I need to do this, and inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives me the strength to do that, that's even in of itself a good positive step. Mm -hmm. So the status quo can't remain. Mm -hmm. Do something, right? If you can go shake the hand, go shake the hand. If you can make dua, make dua. Or even if you can't even get to the stage of making dua, make dua to Allah to help you make dua. Yes. Right? And that's what the sheikh was saying, right? So it's very important that we... Uh, and subhanAllah, this is part of the process of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guiding us. That if you have like a, you know, it doesn't bother you, it doesn't concern you, and you're just good with your life, right? Are you going to be concerned or worried about this? Probably not. 
But the fact that you're a little bit concerned about this, that it's causing you uh, some unease is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to guide you. Like, look, this is something that it's, you need to address. Because one aspect of tazkiyah is very important is that sometimes people try to supplement whatever voids they have with other things, but they don't find happiness and peace because that one critical aspect is missing. And what we need to do is we need to make sure, yes, we find supplementary things, but if we don't address the root issue, then we can find whatever things, other aspects of it, but we need to address that as well. And, and, and even the idea of uh, showing kindness to the object of your rancor, um, you know, he mentions in the commentary that, you know, people, unless a person is like a sociopath or a psychopath, people respond positively to being treated well, right? Nukran al-jameel, a person that rejects good. If you treat somebody well and they don't uh, feel inclined towards you after that good treatment, something might be seriously amiss in that person, right? Something might be seriously uh, off with that person, maybe psychologically, maybe spiritually. So what you will find is that if you treat someone well, this will make them inclined toward you. And that in turn will make you inclined toward them, right? So people, um, there was, and, and Masha, I, I've seen this in practice. I've seen this in practice. Uh, once somebody confided in me, I mean, it's just one brother. He just gets on my last nerve, man. I just can't. It, you know, and when you don't like somebody like that, everything about them agitates you, right? Their laugh gets on your nerves. Why does he have to laugh so boisterously? Man, we don't want to hear that, right? He says the same jokes every... Every time we sit down, he says the same jokes. We don't want to hear those corny jokes. And then that kind of fake, folksy kind of, uh, uh, he's everybody's friend. I just, I can't stand the dude, man. And I said, subhanAllah. <laughs> said, SubhanAllah. They probably talk about me right now. You know, I said, I can't. I said SubhanAllah. And then I saw them at Salat al Eid. And they were giving a gift to that person. It was wrapped in everything, right? And they only had one gift. It wasn't like they were giving gifts to everybody. They only gave a gift just to that person. Bismillah. Tafadl, bismillah. And afterward, I just hugged them like, man, that was huge, man. Because I know what you were attempting to do there, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Tahadu wa tahabu. Give gifts to one another and you will love one another. Like, I just hugged him, and he said, yeah, I'm trying, man. I don't want to live with that stuff on me, man. I don't want to live with that stuff on me. So that's the one person from the jama'ah that I gave a gift on Eid. It was just that one guy. It's like, because I know he really gets on my nerves. This is ihsan. This is spiritual excellence, right? Not, you know, as uh, Sheikh uh, Rizwan was saying, not this kind of fake, I'm always happy, everything is puppy dogs and sunshine. I'm a, that's called being Pollyannish, right? A person who's always happy and I'm very ethereal. And oh yeah, man. No, if I know that there's someone who really gets on my nerves, the willingness to struggle against that feeling to the point of giving them something, right? That I think they might like, so as to rid myself of that, that is true spirituality, right? That is true ihsan, right? Um, mashallah. And you see this, you know, on many occasions in the life of the Prophet I think it's beautiful. You know, what happens if a person, let's say there's a situation that you try and you try to give somebody something, you try, but it's not reciprocated. Right? And that can happen. Remember, you have control over what you do, not over what anybody else does. But at least you can feel a little bit better about yourself. Mm -hmm. That it took me a lot to do that. And that gives you that piece that, alhamdulillah, I'm trying. Right? If you don't try, then you have that uh, sound or that, that voice in your ear saying that you know you can and should try this. Right? But when you actually do it, then it gives you contentment. Then, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm trying. And that makes you feel better about the situation. Because, again, remember, the results are not in our hands. 
results are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to ask us, you gave that, why didn't that person respond in kindness? What happened after? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you, what did you try to do about the situation? And uh, you know, if you're sincere, you do it. Most of the times it will work out. But even if it doesn't, you can find contentment and solace in the fact that, oh, I tried. And that will help you sleep better at night. That will help you get some of the things out of your heart because you're making an effort. And that's all we can do at the end of the day. Absolutely. I mean, sometimes when you, when you make that effort, you free yourself, right? They say holding a grudge is like imbibing poison and expecting the other person to get sick. You free yourself so that even if someone else is still there, hey, look, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. You know, now, if you do, I've had my process, I've taken my time, and inshallah, you will too. And whenever you're ready, if there can be uh, uh, some reconciliation, I'll still be here. But take your time. But me, I've, I've let that go. I've freed myself of that. You know, the Prophet Wasallam, one of the most moving stories of his seerah was that he had a neighbor. And the neighbor knew that the Prophet ﷺ had good character, but he didn't like all of the social upheaval that was being caused by Islam. You know, Islam entered, Bada al Islam You know, Islam entered that society as something strange. And by necessity, it separated wives from husbands, fathers from sons, sons from fathers, tribesmen from their tribes. I mean, Islam had a a disrupted social function, right? And people who really love the status quo, like, can't we just do what we've always done? That will always anger them. Like, why do we have, why all of this new stuff, man? So this neighbor, because uh, they resented the Prophet ﷺ, they would pour trash on the front of his house every morning, just in a show of disdain. I hate you and this whole movement toward the oneness of God and all of this. Ah, right. And the Prophet ﷺ would come out without complaint and just clean the shafra, just clean the, clean the front of his home and not say anything about it. No problem, man. Right. This is a man of ihsan. Right. And, and it's funny because we have these hadith but we don't think about how to like apply them in like contemporary context. Because if I see somebody throw a candy wrapper in front of my house, I go crazy. Yo, my man, this is where I live, bro. I know you trying to get to West Hollywood, but I'm here in Bronzeville, man. Respect this. This is where I live. This is where I pay to live. He like, all right, man. But I never thought about this hadith as like, you know, subhanAllah, the Prophet would get trash dumped on the front of his house every day. And he would clean it up without complaint. No problem. One day he didn't see the trash. And he inquired about the neighbor. You know, I usually see trash on the front of my house, but I didn't. I was worried that something was ha something had happened to you. <laughs> and he learned that the neighbor was deathly ill. And he came in, he visited with the neighbor and, and the neighbor actually said to his son, accept the religion of Abu Al-Qasim, right? Accept the religion of Abu Al-Qasim because these are not the actions of a charlatan. These are not the actions of a liar. And that man's son embraced Islam. You know what I'm saying? So. When you think about ahsan, respond with that which is better. This is what the Prophet ﷺ did all the time. All the time. People, you know, they say that in our humility, we are to be like the earth. Whatever we throw at the earth, it only gives back to us good. Whatever we throw at the earth, it gives back to us good. Right? We give back good. Right? And in that way, you get to live free of vindictiveness and rancor and hatred and animosity. These are all things that weigh down the spiritual heart, right? And when you free yourself of those things, you fly, right? Does not mean that one has to be gullible. Does not mean that one has to uh, forgive and forget 
uh, in a uh, self-effacing way, like, oh, do it to me again. No, I may choose to keep my distance, right? I may choose to, you know, create, you know, firmer boundaries, right? We, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, if you come into my home, if I invite you into my home as a guest and you steal from me, you might not ever get an invitation again. That is a sacred space, man. Right? You know, I don't invite anyone into my home that I don't have um, extremely strong feelings for. You entered my home and you stole something from me. You may not ever enter my home again. I'm just being honest with you. But I forgive you. There's nothing that I want Allah Ta'ala to take you to task for on Yom Al-Qiyamah when we meet him. I forgive you. I don't know why you stole from me, but I forgive you. And in that way, I'm free. In that way, I'm my spiritual best self. Doesn't mean that's like, you know, now I think all of us aspire to get on that like Les Mis level. Remember the movie Les Mis when the man, you know, Jean Valjean, he steals and then the, the, uh, the priest, you know, he comes back and says, you forgot, you forgot the best part. Here, you know, take, you know, take, take the, um, what was that? You guys know the scene. Was that, what, what, did, what did he tell him? You guys know the scene, man. Well, I, well look, I, I know you're Muslims, you don't watch movies. No, not that movie. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but I mean, it, it is kind of, a, it, you know, if you allow yourself to get lost in the corniness of the musical, <laughs> it's actually, you know. But anyway, the man was destitute. The man was poor. The man was fleeing the authorities. And he takes up residence with a priest. And the priest feeds him and offers him shelter. But then, just because he was given to vicious habits, in the middle of the night, he woke up and he stole from the priest. He stole some of the priest's belongings and then he left the house. And then he was apprehended by the police. And the police uh, brought him back and said, Monsignor, these, we recognize these things. He stole these things from you. And the priest said, no, he didn't. I gave him these things, but he forgot the best part. And he took this very prized possession of his and said, he forgot to take these. And he gave him those as well. And it was uh, that moment. And then the man turns and changes his mm -hmm. life. And he said, it was that moment of undeserved human kindness that changed him. You know, sometimes when people are given to qualities of viciousness, it's because they have capitulated to the idea that the world is vicious. It's a dog eat dog world. I'm just, you know, trying to protect myself. Right? If they had the chance, they would do it to me. And when you meet someone that isn't like that, that no, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not a dog eat dog world. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, um, I don't respond to the evil done to me with evil, but, but rather I push myself to respond with good. Sometimes that gives them the confidence then to respond with some good. So I say all of that to say, don't watch corny musicals. No, <laughs> I say all of that to say, sometimes being the person willing to initiate that forgiveness, making sure that you are first, because often people stay in their separate quarters and they refrain from forgiving because they feel like what? That person should forgive. I mean, what? who am I? Right? I, you know, I should require something of them for their atonement. No, you be first, right? You be first. You offer them a life raft. You know, I really hate the way things went between us. And any role that I might have played in whatever that situation was, I apologize. Even if your role was minor. Now, we're not talking about you being assaulted by a complete stranger out of nowhere. We're talking about situations with loved ones, situations with brothers, situations with sisters, people that you care to preserve a relationship with. 
Hey, man, just the fact that we're not on good terms really bothers me. And any role I've played in that, I apologize. Even if they're the major culprit, this is Islam. This is Islam. And when you do that, what do we learn, Sheikh Rizwan? Man tawada'a nafsahu lillah wa rafa'ahu Allah. Whoever lowers themselves for the sake of God, God will elevate them. I just had someone that I know tell me, you know, uh, how can I forgive without making this person do this, 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 and this? What will that mean for my dignity? Allah is the, he is the mu'iz. You forgive for his sake, he will dignify you. He is the mu'iz. You see? So, alhamdulillah. Uh, one of the things that you know helps me, I, I teach uh, students from 7th to 12th grade. And alhamdulillah, I have three kids of my own. And sometimes questions. Nurses, high school teachers, the first in heaven, inshallah. inshallah. Um, so it's like, what type of values are you setting up for people to follow? Because I know some of you may not be teachers, but don't underestimate the influence that you have on people. People will watch you and uh, acknowledge you and look at you, how you carry yourself, these values in others that we care about without looking in the mirror. So it's very important for us to say that this is very, very difficult for me. And I'm going to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me with it. But I would not want my children to have the same concerns or same things. I want my children to be better. And in order for me to help, inshallah, set that good example, I'm going to have to take that step, which personally it may be difficult for me, for the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses me and blesses my children or my students with the ability to do better. So that part of this is understanding the impact and the responsibility that we have, not only on ourselves, but towards others as well. Inshallah. Cool. Ending this uh, chapter, he says, keep also in mind the forgiveness, as mentioned in the sound prophetic tradition, promised twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. Wow. I, I always play around with this and it, it does that. Um, and of course, here he's referring to the fact that on Mondays and Thursdays, there are special angels dispatched to grant God's forgiveness right, to the believers. And if they find two people that uh, have animosity toward each other, they don't qualify for this special forgiveness, right? So great was the prophet's emphasis on our hearts being united that in the authentic hadith, he said, if one of you wrongs the other, and we're not talking like abuse or... We're talking slights, tawafi, things like, you know, this person said something in a gathering, I didn't appreciate it. He actually said, they see each other and they turn their faces away from each other for three days. You know, it's like, I'm not speaking. I'm not speaking. I'm not speaking, right? Or worse yet, when you see the other person and you all of a sudden just act like you have to look at your phone and you act busy or something, it's like, You know, the one that I used to do is I would pretend like my, if it was somebody I had something with them, when I saw them, I would pretend like my attention was diverted and like, yeah, hey, yo, 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 man. You do that for three days. And then afterward, both of those parties begin to accumulate some sin, right? And the best of them is the one that initiates the reconciliation. The one that initiates the reconciliation, one that initiates the salam, is actually free of, of arrogance, right? Um, the other thing I'll say about this before we take a few questions is anyone who wants to earn some great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, great reward, be a mediator. Be someone that comes between parties 
that are at odds with each other and tries to make peace between them. Don't be an instigator. Don't be someone who exacerbates tension. Be a mediator. Like if you know this sister and this sister, they had something once upon a time, or this brother and this brother, they had something once upon a time. Be someone working with your heart and strategically to bring them back together. Like, you know, this is actually one of the only occasions in which it's okay to lie. You can lie for the sake of Islam. You can lie to bring people back together. It's like, Jose, I was just talking to Amr. He was telling me how much he loves you. He was telling me how much he misses you. Yo, Amr, I was just talking to Zayn. He was telling me how much he loves you, man, how he misses you, and how, you know, the Thursday night basketball sessions you guys would have are, 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 were legendary, and how he misses that. And when they see each other, some of the ice has melted, right? And one of them will extend. Yo, Zay, you know, Ubey told me, man, you know, uh, what you mentioned to him. And he's like, yo, I never mentioned anything to Ubey. It's funny, because he told me you said some nice stuff about me too. And what happens is what? When they recognize that there's one person working to bring them together, they almost feel ashamed at themselves. Here goes this guy, isn't even involved in this, trying to make sure that we're together. Let's give him a little help, man. And then there's always a handshake or a hug or, I don't know, COVID-19, maybe a demolition man situation or something like that. I, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know what you do with COVID. It's like, yo, I forgive you. I, I forgive you, bro. I really not. But, you know, you know, my point is be a mediator. Be a peacemaker. You know, don't be someone who adds fuel to personal fires. Right? We used to call that an instigator. A person that, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, Amir, I know, you know, we grew up around some classic instigators, boy. And the instigator knew exactly what to say to just inflame, you know, ah, oh, man. I mean, and it, all, it always, look, I'll tell you, Amir, no, no, it always starts like they're reluctant to tell you, but they have to. It's like, yo, man. I don't even want to tell you this. <laughs> yeah. Quite frankly, I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I mean, he was sitting up in the lunchroom. I mean, just talking about you like, you know what? I'm sorry I even brought it up. I'm sorry. Mm. At that point, the person's like, no, no, what did he say? What, no, what did he say? Nah, nah, you know what, man? Just, you know, forget I mentioned it, man. Forget I mentioned it. <laughs> And now, now you're like, no, he lets you get all the way up to 10. And then he comes out, puts all kinds of condiments and hot sauces, sweet baby raised barbecue sauce on it, and then serves it to you. And when you're steaming hot, now he's like, and guess what? <laughs> he's at the park right now playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Guess what? You know, I, 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 I'm glad you're ready to confront him because when I was walking over here, I saw him at the park. He up there hooping, right? He up there playing basketball like he don't have a concern in the world. He out here talking crazy about you like this and he not even worried. Only thing he worried about is making his jump shot, man. I know you ain't gonna let him just, now you walk, now you walking down the street. <laughs> Don't be an instigator, man. Be a mediator. No, 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 no. Come here, man. Y'all, y'all come here, man. Y'all stop, man. Now look, we're brothers, man. We're brothers. And we can't afford all of this. We're Muslims. We got the media talking crazy about us. We got, I mean, we're, we can't afford to dislike each other, man. Really. We can't afford this, man. Right, we need some, our spaces have to be characterized by love, man. Really, love, sisterhood, brotherhood. We can't afford all this, man. It's like, isn't it bad enough that, you know, people talk about us in the mainstream media and 
people have misgivings about our intention in America. And, you know, now the big thing is, you know, the Taliban have reassumed control in Afghanistan. And what does that mean? And, man, we don't have time for all of this, man. You're my brother. I love you. If you're practicing Dean, you're holding on to hot coals. And I esteem that in you. Not that you didn't do something wrong and that you don't make mistakes, but we'll get past this, man. We'll get past this. So, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. I'm We'll leave the space open uh, for questions, comments, rebuttals, suggestions, um, anything that you might like, inshallah. It's still my just two points before we. Bismillah. So, uh, Bismillah. Um, one thing, one of the hadith that really, really scares me is the hadith of the Prophet, which is mentioned in the text is that on Mondays and Thursdays when the deeds are elevated, the angels are told, wait for these two until they reconcile. Mm. People put a lot of effort in prayer, recitation of Quran, they could, a lot of these things that are extra. But one of the conditions that it's waiting for is that reconciliation. So if we want our deeds to get accepted, obviously if there's extenuating circumstances as abuse and all other things of that sort, those are exceptions. But if there's something which is reconcilable and we're just leaving it and, and not addressing it, that can affect the acceptance of our deeds. And that's scary, right? Another issue that comes up is that um, reminded to myself and to everybody that some of us may be going through certain type of situations where it's not enough for us to deal with the situation by ourselves. So if anybody needs professional help, to move forward in their life, please do get that. Please do get that and feel confident as a Muslim or a Muslima that you're not doing anything un-Islamic. You're just trying to get some peace, some support to be able to move forward in your life. And some people dealing with serious trauma, it's good to have friends can help to a certain extent, but they may need professional help and there's something that we encourage. So some people think, okay, I'm doing tazkiyah. That can be part of your tazkiyah process. And that is something which is encouraged because you're not expected to be perfect and you're not expected to do this alone. What you're expected to do is to try to get better in whatever way that can happen, inshallah. So it's a reminder that please, if anybody, if you know anybody, you can encourage anybody and you yourself, if you need to, do it, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it beneficial for all of us. Uh, I, was, I was wondering, how do you bridge the gap between mistrust in someone and also reconciling and forgiveness so the whole idea of reconciling for their for islam for brotherhood they're them hurting us or at the same time they're not willing to or maybe you know not working out with them um so i would say that both things are not mutually exclusive it doesn't mean that if you forgive someone that doesn't mean that you automatically need to trust the person reconcile as if things were before a people might need to rebuild their trust. Prophet said a believer doesn't get stung from the same hole twice. So if I know that this person has lied to me, yes, I forgive them for that lie, but am I going to put my trust in that person again? It's going to take time for me to do that. But whatever has happened in the past, I might be like, look, whatever happened in the past, I forgive you for that. But in order for us to be back to how we were, it's going to take time for me. And that's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine, inshallah. Yeah, I agree when, uh, wholeheartedly. I mean, um, you know, turning with your heart toward someone does not mean that you do so without uh, any reservation, you know, based on past experience. No, I mean, it doesn't, you know, but I think what we're talking about here in terms of rancor is just the willingness to make that turn with the heart. Meaning, you know, the heart is turning back, but in terms of restoring the trust, that could, that could take some time. One of the questions that we have on uh, online, it says, isn't it true that too much of fire can be uh, a punishment? So is it also rancor slash envy that you hope someone is given more so they uh, can keep going astray and so on? Too much what? Uh, too much of fire? Afia. 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 Oh, um, hmm. I don't. Did you understand the question? Kind of, sort of. 
Uh, take, take a shot. Take no, a shot. Take I think that if you want, uh, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He said, فَلَمَّا نَأْسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا فَتَحْنَا عَلِمْ أَبُوَا بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِيحُوا بِمَا أُتَا أَخَدْنَا بَغْتَنَا فَيْدَا هُمْ بِلِسُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when sometimes in this life, when people are given reminders, and they turn away from the reminders, Allah opens up all of the gates of this world for them, and then He takes them right away. Mm -hmm. Right? And then they're in a state of despair. So if a person um, wants somebody to, to have a lot, you know how they say the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Sure. That can also be a, an aspect of wanting ill will towards another right. person, yeah. right? And that's a very fair point that ill will doesn't just mean taking things away, but any type of harm, even if it's, if it's through prosperity, mm -hmm. that can also be encompassed in what we're talking about. Okay, I see, I see what the question was. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the Sheikh wholeheartedly that it's not ultimately about wanting them to have abundance or wanting them to have scarcity. It's wanting them to have goodness or wanting them to have its opposite. So if you want a person to have goodness, it's not just in material comfort, but it's material comfort that increases them in nearness to Allah, right? It's material comfort with gratitude, right? Material comfort utilized in ways that are God-pleasing but not, yeah, I want them to have more and more and more so they forget Allah more and more and more and then get taken baghdatan in hakadah. No, no, that's the, you know, um, we actually don't gain anything out of wanting bad for people. Assalamu alaikum. Um, um, I have a question. Um, how do you overlook the faults of someone who is constantly like toxic towards you? Wouldn't it better to distance yourself from that person? And um, could you also like elaborate uh, when you say don't get bitten by the same fault twice? Um, yes, I mean, if, if someone is consistently, you know, I think sometimes we don't, we don't recognize kind of the, um, there's, there are circles of, of intimacy in, in friendship. You know, for every Muslim, they are due um, kind of, you know, basic kind treatment and cordiality, you know, the giving of salam, the returning of salam, um, trying to, to greet them with a the kind of tanqal wajj, you know, I'm, I'm in a good, I'm in a good, you know, space, does not mean that if I know that someone's behavior is consistently toxic toward me, that I want to um, form the kind of relationship with them that would find them in my space, find them uh, um, a close personal friend of mine, someone with whom I'm spending, you know, considerable amounts of time, maybe no. But I think I want to be sure that even for that person, I don't have any rancor in my heart toward them. I might not ever be very close to them, right? I might not ever say, come on, come over and, uh, you know, have some tea, maybe, maybe never. But even that person, I just, they're, you know, a member of the community. May Allah bless them. May Allah give them good. Uh, may Allah give them guidance. Uh, I don't want anything bad for them. Right? But does it mean that uh, uh, I would allow them to get close to me? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and in terms of being, being, uh, 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 being stung uh, the same way twice, uh, it's just saying that, you know, you don't subject yourself to the same uh, kinds of abuse over and over and over and over and over and over, right? At some point, you create some boundaries and, and, and create some parameters. Uh, I think one of the issues is that I've seen as an imam in the masjid is it's e easy, easier, it's never easy, but easier when the people are not related to you. And it becomes a lot more challenging when the people are related to you. And I think boundaries are very important. And sometimes, again, depending on the situation, taking a step back and giving yourself some space to work on yourself with the intention that eventually your goal is to, you know, make amends in whatever form that is. But at this moment, it's just too difficult. And sometimes you need help with that. I think those are all valid concerns. Um, so taking a step back and saying, and then even just going to the person and being like, look, uh, whatever has happened in childhood or whatever, 
that really hurt me. But inshallah, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward. And inshallah, uh, our relationship, I still want to have a relationship with you, but it can't be on the same terms as it was before. And sometimes that takes help and additional people involved. So these are very complex issues, but they're very real issues. So I don't want anybody to feel guilty and be like, you know, everything you told me, I, I, it's just impractical in my situation. No, those are further conversations you can have with people on a personal basis. But inshallah, understand that Islam is a very beautiful religion and it observes the rights of individuals, right? So if somebody's causing like mental health issues or toxicity that's having a negative impact, is that mean the same, do the same hadith that apply in every situation apply to that specific situation? Not necessarily. So it's important to look at the context, take a step back. And the goal is to, there's, there's where you are and where you want to get. But in order to get there, you might have to take a step back, take a detour, and then eventually get there, inshallah. So still have those goals, but understand that people, you have to meet people where they are and then go towards it, inshallah. Mm -hmm. now, have you is it possible to be free of rancor without necessarily forgiving a person? I don't think so. I mean, of course, I mean, um, because, the, the, you know, I find that the source of rancor is, um, um, you know, there is a, um, you know, when, when someone has wronged you in some way or disappointed you even, I think, in my experience, it is what that uh, act suggests to me about me. Meaning, why, what is it about me that would um, uh, make you talk to me this way, or treat me this way, or disrespect me this way? And I think that as long as I'm holding on to that, I'm going to be rancorous. I'm going to be very, very angry. It won't be until I can forgive, sometimes not only the other person, but myself. Right? It won't be until I can forgive that some of that rancor decreases. Right? Um, so for me, being free of rancor um, uh, and forgiveness to me, they're, they're synonymous. Um, I mean, I think we can claim indifference, right? Like, uh, you know, I don't even think about it. But what's preventing you from saying I forgave the person? I know people who claim indifference all the time. It's like, you know, where are you in terms of forgiving that person? I just don't even think about them. I mean, why can't you say you forgave them? Because I don't think about them. <laughs> no. I don't know how much I believe that. I don't know how much I believe that. Right? So I think they're synonymous, yeah. I think one of the things that I encourage everyone to do, and inshallah, if you can memorize, I usually say it at the end of the Jum'ah khutbah, when I give is, well, the beautiful dua is in Surah, uh, Surah Hashr. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَوْفُ رَحِيمٌ Make dua, Allah, forgive us and those that preceded us in faith, and do not let us have any rancor in hearts for those that believe. Oh Allah, you are the forgiving, you are the merciful, right? The reason that's so important is that whatever a person has done, to forgive that specific thing, yes, I agree 100%. It's going to take time, it's going to take for that to be removed. But that the fact that this person loves Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is enough for me to forgive that what they've done to me because they love Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So have that be the overriding factor. Yes, the specifics you can talk about and work on. That's going to take time. That's going to talk whatever we've been talking about. But the default attitude that we need to have towards every single Muslim who loves Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that this person loves Allah, uh, Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I love them for that reason. And when you love somebody for that reason, it's easier, again, it's not easy, but it's easier to put up with some of the inconveniences and overlook some of the shortcomings. Uh, uh, due to the time, I want to ask one more question online, inshallah, and then we can close.
close out for the sake of time, inshallah. Um, the last question for the night is, what is the potential danger in being in Pollyannish or appearing as if nothing could really get under your skin? I think um, the danger in that is that a lot actually gets under your skin. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, I guess, you know, uh, they had this big thing recently about Naomi Osaka and pulling out of the French Open and um, saying like, it's okay not to be okay. And um, in a lot of ways, I, I, that, that message, it resonated with me. Um, you know, the Prophet Wasallam had an entire year of the seerah that was called Amul Huzn, the year of sadness. Now, of course, he didn't go out and announce to people, uh, this is the year of sadness, but it must have been visible. Right? There must have been something that people close to him could see that marked that time as a time that he wasn't as cheerful or he wasn't as buoyant or he wasn't as carefree uh, as he normally was. And the fact that that period was something that they saw as lasting an entire year, for me suggests that you know, there was no obligation to always appear to just be happy all the time. When Ibrahim, his son, uh, وسلم, uh, passes away, he's crying and they say, Allah, are you displeased with the qadr of Allah? Right? And the Prophet والسلام, said what? No, no, these are tears of shafaqah. I'm not displeased with God's qadr, but there are some things that one experiences that are very difficult to bear, right? And I'm not uh, hiding that through a kind of forced, it's okay, everything is cool, man. You know, I'm, I'm so spiritual that I have to kind of perform this false kind of stoic, you know, right? Or it's, it's all good, it's all good. No, sometimes it's not, you know, it's not good, right? Sometimes it's not good, but we're working to always be at peace with what Allah has decreed. Doesn't mean that we do so with a smile all the time, man. Right? Doesn't mean that we do so while laughing all the time, right? Sometimes it's not a laughing matter. Sometimes it's very difficult, but I'm just trying to keep my balance. And I'll, I'll offer, I should take this one last word. No, Zakumal Khairan. I think there is another question there, but um, one of the, it's not authentic, nor is it sustainable. You can put up a front for a certain period of time, but eventually it's going to boil over. And when that does, things can be catastrophic. Right? So it's very important that if there's an issue, you recognize it, acknowledge it, and try to deal with it rather than playing it off as if it's not an issue. Because it will fester, it will grow, and it will come out at a time where things can get out of control. So it's very important for us to try to be authentic with ourselves, honest with ourselves, and honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And recognize that we're not perfect. We're not angelic. We're not expected to be. We all have weaknesses. We all have imperfections. But we do have a responsibility to try to improve. And that's what this care is about. And inshallah, as long as we acknowledge that and try to get better, inshallah, that's the best thing we can do. Is that, I have a question. I think answered. It's okay? All right. Oh, no, no, please. I think please. there was one question. Please. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Please. I thought it was on last online. Please. So it's an answer. I'll be, I'll be super quick, but it's actually something that you mentioned about setting boundaries um, answer to one of the questions, but in terms of a relationship that you have an Islamic obligation to, like, for example, a parent, so where does, where does that kind of lie in terms of, like, when you stop trying, when, how can you set that boundary, because, again, there is bitter already there, so how, how does that work with, like, an Islamic obligation to keep trying? This is a very valid question, and very valid uh, and real issue, right? So, among the greatest of rights after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the Prophet sallam, are the rights of the parents. But there's also responsibilities. And sometimes parents cross certain limits and we have to be aware of that. And if a father or mother um, you know, crosses those limits, the sharia doesn't say that you know, there's, there's no rights of the children either. So we have to be very cognizant and aware of that. And um, obviously, if you're in that situation, 
it, everything looks like a cross of violation of boundaries, right? So I think that talking to somebody, the mutual party that we can that you can trust, and letting uh, seeing things from an objective perspective would help in that situation, because I've seen certain situations as an imam that the birrul walidain is extremely important, and I agree with everything. Obviously, it's mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah, but when abuse can potentially become involved and boundaries are crossed to the extent where i'll give you a situation where a, a brother who was living with his parents his wife would not go home without him because his father was coming on to her and she would go to this uh, like a walmart or something and wait for the husband to come home and then escort him to his house and he's like i can't say anything to my father because that's not but that's a misunderstanding and sometimes overstepping the boundaries and limits, right? So these are things that we as a Muslim community need to be a little bit more educated about that. Yes, it is extremely, extremely important. But if those type of situations occur, there's also guidelines and parameters in, built in the Sharia to help a sister in that type of situation, to help the son in that situation. Boundaries have to be there because Islam doesn't just say that, okay, there's one set of rights which can potentially, even if they're abusive. Mm -hmm. okay. so, I want to answer this question. This is from Malaysia. Um, what advice do you have for an adult child who have trouble forgiving their father for, for, uh, for betrayal, especially when their father feels that he is without fault? Of course, they still honor their father and talk to them, talk to him occasionally, but their hearts are still hurt and they're in still pain. Mm. I think um, in a situation like that, sometimes the the best approach is uh, the clearest, most transparent, and most straightforward approach, which is just to attempt a conversation. Uh, I, I realize that not all cultures. Um, kind of have this, you know, I think sometimes it's very easy to assume that everyone can just talk to their parents. You know, many of us, we grew up, you know, I probably could broach any topic of conversation with my mother and she would be willing to uh, listen to me. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that that is reflective of everyone else's experience. Some people it's like, there's certain things you just cannot talk to your parents about. Like, I just cannot bring this up. Um, in that case, I think it's important to remember that you aren't alone. You know, there has to be someone, uh, a respected imam or a family member or, um, you know, uh, a family friend or someone that you could say, you know, I would have difficulty uh, sharing this with my dad, but because we've never really had any uh, accountability on this point, I really feel like it, it prevents me from being like 100 with my father the way that I would like to be. Um, uh, could you mention that to him in the most respectful, gentle, and kind way? And just make sure that you disclose that the only reason you're talking to him is that I would be completely uh, uh, mortified at the idea of initiating a conversation with my father that could embarrass him in any way. Like I couldn't, like I just could not have that conversation with him. And if someone is gentle and delicate um, and wise, maybe they might be able to have that conversation or just kind of broach it as a topic, that, you know, um, you know, uh, your son Abdullah, you know, uh, came to me and, um, you know, you just have to be wise, you know, it's like he wanted, he wanted to mention this, but he also uh, made clear to point out how much he values you, how great a father you've been to him, um, how, you know, the relationship that you all have is very important to him. It's one that he treasures. Um, but this issue uh, has never really been addressed effectively. And, you know, sometimes he thinks about it. It's something that's on his heart a little bit. And then we just we just go from there trying to, to deal with it, you know. So, Bismillah. 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 B
اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة أو أقل من ذلك اللهم لنا حقا حقا ورزقنا اتباعه ولنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا استنابه ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our hearts firm in his obedience. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts from rancor, from envy, from jealousy, from all diseases of the heart. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to continuously work towards improvement. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anyone going through any type of difficulty, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that difficulty with ease. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his beautiful names and his glorious attributes that he helps us in every situation and circumstance and doesn't leave us our own faculties or devices for even the blink of an eye. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see truth as truth and give us the ability to follow it. Allow us to see falsehood as falsehood and give us the ability to stay away from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all aspects of our lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the organizers and to bless everybody who participated in this gathering tonight, anyone that's online. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to have many more gatherings like this and make us a source of goodness for ourselves and for others. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us uh, grant us sincerity and give us the ability to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat amma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-masih. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Subhanaka Allah. Alhamdulik. Nashadu ala ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayhi. Thank you.